Hi everyone and welcome to week 13. What I want to get started with is flagging the final assessment, which is the final essay. That is a 1500 word essay. It's worth 55% of your overall mark. This essay you will need to use a minimum of 10 academic sources. Now Given that you will have completed your annotated bibliography assessment by now, that means you've already got five of them, so you need to only find five more. So, minimum ten, yes, but you've already done some of that groundwork. And it's important that you engage with texts from the unit as well as use your own research. So that means you use uh, some of the assigned readings, but you also need to find your own materials as well. Let's talk about the overall assessment structure. Now you're going to be using an essay format. So as you know, you're going to have the introduction paragraph, a body, and a concluding paragraph. The introduction paragraph, it needs to introduce the topic, introduce your thesis, which is your key argument or your conclusion, and it needs to give an essay outline. It needs to briefly explain to the reader what the structure of the overall essay will be. The body of the essay is comprised of uh, paragraphs um, giving supporting evidence and arguments for the conclusion or the thesis. It needs to be a logical sequence. So think about what order you're going to put your paragraphs in. The paragraph before the conclusion should be what some people call a crunch paragraph. The key lines of argument all come together to demonstrate the credibility of your conclusion or your thesis. And then the concluding paragraph, you don't want to introduce new material. You provide an overview summary of the argument and it's also worth leaving the reader with some food for thought, such as what are some next steps? Um, in this topic, perhaps future research or new policy or practice. That's a good thing to have a think about. Now in terms of paragraph structure, you have your topic sentence, which is the first sentence, you have a supporting sentence after that, or a few supporting sentences, and you finish up with a concluding sentence. What's in your topic sentence? It's kind of like Similar to the essay structure, overall you need to introduce the main point of the paragraph um, and it should follow from the previous paragraph where possible. The supporting sentences provide the supporting evidence or data, references, arguments and so on. The third assessment is going to be assessed along the following criteria. It's going to be assessed according to its ability to address the essay question, the clarity and sophistication of your argument, evidence of having read and understood relevant literature, and evidence of critical thinking and engagement with theory, as well as the ability to write clearly and reference appropriately to university standards. In our case, we are wanting to use the Harvard system. The essay should be 1.5 or double lined spacing. Um, you need to be, you need to clearly indicate uh, what question you've selected and you must include the reference list at the end of the essay. It needs to be in alphabetical order. You don't need to use numbering or dot points. Okay, that's part of the Harvard uh, method of referencing is just an alphabetical list according to or formatted in a particular way. If you don't include a reference list, this is um, going to put your assessment in danger of failing and academic misconduct. Another thing to think about is avoid overly long sentences. Simple is better. And you'll notice that I've included a link to a handy online tool that can help you with uh, writing more clearly that support the main point of the paragraph. 
and then your concluding sentence is going to wrap up the paragraph, summarize how the point you're making in the paragraph relates to the overall uh, topic and your overall argument or thesis, and it's going to help lead into the next paragraph. Just a few pointers on how to pass. A common problem with assessment one was that students were not relating their chosen concepts and research back to the specific topic. You need to relate your essay to the specific topic provided in the learning guide. You can't create your own topic and it's essential that you read the instructions for this assignment. Um, you need to demonstrate some basic scholarly research skills. Don't hesitate to ask for advice or help from your uh, unit coordinator or tutor where appropriate. Uh, and remember, and this hasn't been an issue as far as I can tell, uh, Wikipedia is not an academic source. So um, I'll let you, um, I think most of you have your head around that. Make sure to follow the Harvard Referencing Style Guide. That can be found with a really uh, quick Google search. You just type in um, WSU, Western Sydney University, Harvard, and it should be a PDF that comes up as more or less the first um, search result on Google. And don't forget that preparation is key. Spend a bit of time thinking, what's my overall argument? What are the main points I want to make? And then spend a bit of time working out your essay structure so that by the time it comes to writing the substantive content of your essay, it's almost like you're just ticking boxes and dropping in content into the right spot. Now, there are four topics um, that you can choose from for this final essay. The first one is asking, recent crime prevention policy and initiatives can be seen as highly politicized. Discuss the link between law and order politics, fear of crime, and crime prevention strategy using local examples. The second option, citing examples provide a critical analysis of preventive policing strategies such as hotspot, zero tolerance, problem oriented and so on, and discuss their impact on the community. In your answer, discuss why these strategies are popular and if there are any side effects on the police and community relations. The third option, crime prevention is, uh, industry is growing at a rapid pace in Australia and around the world. Critically discuss this trend and outline some of the key dangers that may emerge from the commercialization of crime control. The fourth option, discuss the importance of evaluation to crime prevention strategy. Why is it so important in producing effective crime policy and prevention strategies? So let's recap last week. Um, evaluation research can be challenging and complex, and there's a need to be explicit about theoretical and research assumptions underlying the evaluation approach. There are different methods of evaluation and their use depends on what type of intervention, uh, crime prevention intervention was used, what resources are available and what type of problem um, you're trying to evaluate. Both the outcomes of crime prevention and the implementation process need to be evaluated. Evaluation should be an integral part of crime prevention interventions, more generally speaking, with measures taken before, during, and after the intervention. Now, developing an evidence base is one thing, but implementing well-supported crime prevention programs as policy is another problem in itself, because policy is not a straightforward or rational process. There are various theories that help us understand the policy process, and last week we had a quick look at a multiple streams theory to help us understand how different streams of problem, policy, and politics can intersect at opportune points in time, known as policy windows, and lead to policy outcomes and policy change with the help of policy entrepreneurs. This week we are looking at pre-crime and the future of criminology and crime prevention. Overall, we're going to look at security and pre-crime, the temporal shift in focus. We'll have a 
little bit of an exploration of normativity and security. Um, we will discuss a few developments in criminological thinking and um, touch upon some new materialist approaches emerging from um, some sociological disciplines that might be useful moving forward into the future. The emergence of criminology was in the context of a post-crime society, meaning that crime was theorized as a harm and practices uh, to ensure social order were applied after the fact of this harm taking place. So in a post-crime society, you have crimes, you have offenders, victims, crime control, policing, investigations, trial and punishment. So these are the basic parts of criminology today. In pre-crime, we have a shifting temporal perspective. That means we are anticipating and trying to prevent that which hasn't yet and might not even happen. So in pre-crime, we have things like calculation, risks, uncertainty, surveillance, precaution, moral hazard, prevention, and over and across all of these things, we have the pursuit of security. Now, this shift is not only temporal, meaning time, but also sectoral, because it has spread out from the state to private community and individuals, embracing preemptive endeavors only remotely related to crime. So, security is this broader shift towards a future-looking focus, anticipatory and preventative, and also including things that aren't directly related to crime, but managing risks more generally. Now, building on this temporal shift is the role of, of non-state actors in the production of security. Because it's no longer enough to focus our attention only on the criminal justice systems of the state, without including private, commercial, communal, and voluntary and individual actors. So there's a changing relationship between the public and private spheres more generally. Um, these include mechanisms of delegation, of contracting out services, and strategies of responsabilization. And all of these things remind us that we need to look into the new techniques through which states govern at a distance. And this might be a bit familiar in terms of talking about governmentality theory. Now, the relationships between different security practices and ventures are now quite complex, and the distinction between public and private is increasingly blurred. For example, states may contract out public services to private providers. States will regulate the private sector through licensing, inspection, and auditing. And in some cases, you have private sponsorship of state policing um, through the provision of hardware or even vehicles. In some U.S. states, the police are literally brought to you by Toyota. Now, the tendency to see private security as a competitor to public policing has given this view that they are they share a very similar function but there are important temporal uh, differences and distinctions of in terms in role and orientation um, the traditional post crime functions of the state police in enforcing criminal law such as pursuing criminal investigations prosecuting criminal offenses and serving the criminal process generally apply much less to those working in the private security sector. Common areas uh, and functional overlap in terms of pre-crime um, between public and private is in respect to practices of patrol, surveillance, maintaining order, and protecting property. Um, once an offence has occurred, private security agents who are constrained by the limits of their legal powers 
and the interests of their employers are quick to dispatch suspects to the public police. In the post-crime context, uh, agents of the security industry are not so much interested in punishing um, for the wrong that has been done um, or making good out of the situation. Rather, the focus is more on a narrow economic sense of recovering loss. So the principal interest is to identify the source of an opportunity that may get taken uh, and to harden targets and minimize future losses. The distinct functions of public police and private security are worthy of closer attention because there's a larger change, and that is the growth of private security signifies um, not just the transfer of authority for crime control, but a radical shift from post hoc logic of criminal justice to a forward trajectory of preemption and protection. We're not dealing with crime after the fact, but preempting it and preventing it. So the key transition here is not so much just the shift between public and private, but the temporal move from post crime to pre crime. Another thing to take into consideration is the role of security as public and private goods. Security, broadly speaking, might be th theorized along three main features. The first one is that seeking security implies this temporal shift toward pre-crime. It's less about reacting to, controlling, or prosecuting crime than addressing the conditions that lead to it. The logic of security dictates earlier and earlier interventions to reduce opportunity, to target harden, and to increase surveillance, even before committing a crime becomes a distant possibility. The second feature is that risk frames and provides a rationale for many features of the security society. Although concern about the risks of crime is a major force behind the market for security. Um, risk is driven by a larger array of anxieties that don't only relate to crime. Additionally, the logic of actuarialism underpins measures designed to locate, sort, and manage diverse risks. And this actuarial logic becomes at least as important as reactive penal measures. There's a preoccupation with individual, sorry, the preoccupation with individual offenders is overlaid by this concern to identify and classify suspect populations. And this is done in order to manage the collective risks that these populations pose. So in this context, in the security context, Prison becomes less about punishment or reform, and it's more about just a storage place or a warehouse where we can detain those elements of the population that we have uh, categorized as high risk. So you can see that there's a change here. The third aspect is that rather than focusing on crime as a wrongdoing, the dominant logic of security is to preempt, minimize, and displace loss. So there's a distinction between crime as harm or wrongdoing and crime as addressing crime to uh, prevent loss. Now, this pressure to um, prevent loss or minimize loss comes a lot from the insurance industry um, because they're that industry is devoted to managing and pooling risk. Security provision is also concerned with providing the appearance and the assurance of protection. The millions that get spent annually on security come from the demands of private and corporate consumers of security to cocoon themselves, and when it comes to commercial enterprises, to cocoon their customers in this apparently safe environment. And that appearance of safety um, is as much a driver of the consumption of security as it is to 
um, try and directly reduce crime rates. A key concern that comes to mind in that case is access. The protection um, provided as a public good to which all have access then becomes endangered by its commercial sale as a commodity because access to a private commodity is limited by the capacity of people to buy that commodity. So there's a distinction between security as public good and security as private commodity. The source of who's providing this security is arguably less important than the question of who can access the um, provision of security. And to the extent that the private industry is becoming a major provider of security, we have the question of market-driven discrimination in the distribution of risk. So what that means is that market-driven, whoever can afford to buy security can access it, and those who cannot afford sec um, security have a disproportionate burden of risk because they don't have access to security that protects them from risk. Securing an exclusive commercial environment, such as an inner city business district, may be conducive to maximizing turnover, right, maximizing profit, but this has displacement effects that bear disproportionately on those areas nearby that are less secured or unsecured. So it's a question of those who don't have the capacity to buy security bear a disproportionate burden of risk. It's also important to note that security is an inherently normative concept. It describes a good. We can debate the meaning of security precisely, but we can't sort of avoid the need to establish what type of good is security, for whom is it sought, and by what means is security achieved. So there's a need to ensure that the way that security is achieved is consistent with what goals security seeks to achieve. That Security measures are inclusive, consistent with um, our values of fairness and equality, and that um, security does not unduly erode trust uh, nor impinge on our civil liberties needlessly, and that security is proportionate to the risks that are faced. And, and, and these questions are all challenges that need to be addressed moving forward thinking about security. And it follows that if criminal criminological thinking is to respond to the challenge of security, it has this implicit duty to engage in normative theorizing. So what would this normative theorizing look like? Well, the first step is to dig up and examine the hidden assumptions that drive the security agenda through imminent critique. And that involves revealing the political and economic interests that underlie um, the way that security is conducted presently, and revealing the intellectual assumptions, the theoretical assumptions that security policies are based upon. And we also need to draw upon the insights from um, adjacent disciplines, such as sociology and psychology and so on, and perhaps even other disciplines not traditionally drawn on uh, to help address these new challenges faced by criminology in addressing our concerns about security. Criminology distinguish its, distinguishes itself from its disciplinary um, neighbours less by any specific uh, theoretical framework or methodological approach or uh, value orientation than by its overarching concern with a specific topic, namely crime. Um, criminology is only now just establishing itself uh, institutionally through the emergence of faculties and degree programs. And that said, many criminologists 
still um, reside in parent faculties such as law or sociology um, and have been trained in these older or different disciplines. Now the cutting edge of criminological inquiry already extends outside the criminal justice system to the uh, temporally prior logics of actuarial justice and risk management, surveillance and social and situational crime prevention, for example. But there are other areas um, where there are big changes uh, that still await a fully developed criminology. Some of these topics include reassurance policing, uh, the role of private security, and the uh, increasingly transnational character of policing, security, and intelligence services, as well as the war on terror, and so on. Now, at this point, we also want to think about the role of criminological thinking in its relation to practices of crime control and crime prevention. Now, the um, writer Antonio Gramsci um, made a distinguish, what well, he distinguished between uh, what he called traditional intellectuals and organic intellectuals. The traditional intellectuals were those who thought of themselves as free thinkers outside of society and politics, but end up supporting the status quo precisely because they don't get involved. And then organic in intellectuals who um, are quite self-conscious um, and play an active political role critiquing the sort of dominant hegemonic power structures and suggesting alternate ways of thinking about problems. And um, the organic intellectual approach, um, you know, is is something to not be scoffed at um, because it allows a way of, um, you know, more closely linking theory to practice in a meaningful way. Uh, so to do this, it involves systematic criticism of existing practices and a detailed specification of what's being done wrong. But at another level, this also requires utopian thinking uh, and thinking or imagining um, alternate worlds uh, without being constrained by the limits of our present reality. So it's about pushing the boundaries of what it is possible to conceive in terms of our ideal society and how we want to practice crime prevention and moving towards these goals. Now that said, there is a sort of halfway point between just being critical and thinking of these pie-in-the-sky utopian ideals, and that's um, taking the intermediate path of a normative theoretical approach. The normative project is seen as less ambitious than the utopian one um, because it begins with the status quo. It begins with the current state of affairs rather than just a blank sheet and... Um, you know, thinking of the ideal situation. So the normative project starts within the realms of what is presently possible rather than what is ideal. Now, it doesn't, need, it doesn't mean we just accept the status quo as given or as inevitable, but it does ground normative theory within empirical inquiry. We need to develop theories that respect um, the current material conditions we're operating within and not simply, you know, looking far off without any connection to our present reality. So, as a result, normative theorizing has a greater chance of developing suggestions that are, in some respect, more realizable. So, through this normative approach, uh, criminological inquiry might aim to elaborate and defend a particular conception of justice that is relevant and appropriate to the problems and the potentials of the security society that is emerging before us. Now, earlier it was suggested that um, criminology is a less settled disciplinary state because it draws on other um, nearby disciplines for intellectual resources, but it doesn't need to be a one-way process because this can also feed back into uh, other disciplines. The insights in criminology might then feedback into, for example, sociology or psychology. Now, 
an important uh, alternative um, conceptual uh, resource could be the uh, discipline of international relations, because international relations is interested in things like national security uh, and different security strategies, and it has a sort of a, a conceptual toolkit that it works with. Of particular interest to us is the idea of critical security studies, which is a combination of um, different approaches, but these are linked together by a commitment to think critically about security, to not take security um, for granted or accept the status quo, um, to sort of move away from statism or state-centered approaches, and to widen the security agenda, and to ground our study uh, and practice of security in a broader concern for human emancipation. Now, emancipation here uh, is the idea of freeing people from the physical and human constraints that stop them carrying out what they would freely choose to do. So, in this respect, security and emancipation are two sides of the same same coin. Because emancipation is seen to produce true security. The thing is, emancipation in this framework is so loosely expressed that it also raises a lot of questions. But it remains a provocative idea, it's a useful starting point, because it asks us to consider the means by which people can seek their own security, rather than having it put upon them by the state or by private enterprise or by the pressures of the market. Stemming from critical security studies is this concept of human security. And what this does is it displaces national security and focuses or incorporates ideas from international relations and development studies to shift our focus on people rather than states. A lot of our discourse about security has been about the relationship between the state and the private sector and the individual. Human security is saying, let's sort of look at people rather than states. So this brings um, international relations closer to a sociological understanding, and by bringing it closer to a sociological understanding, it becomes uh, sort of more relevant to criminological interests. Now, the goods to be protected in human security are not only political and territorial, but also personal, communal, and environmental. So in place of this logic of defense, the idea of human security promotes a concern for the basic needs of human flourishing and upholding human rights. Um, it's predicated upon this belief that the main threats to security come from deprivation and frustration, and these things together breed disorder and in its extreme forms terrorism. Human security has become important conceptually and practically, um, motivating efforts to supplement state provision of security with programs aimed at empowering people to secure their own interests. The state retains a vital role in developing and sustaining norms and policies and institutions essential to protection, but human security requires supplementing um, of these things by the expansion of human rights and fostering basic goods of health, education, and employment at the micro-individual level. So to achieve these larger concerns, security is reconceived not as a technical, military, or policing issue, but as a political concept, wherein state security is less an end in itself than the means for securing individual liberty. Lastly, in pursuit of this larger normative project, uh, criminology could benefit from the insights and intellectual resources coming from moral philosophy and political theory to address this difficult question of how to achieve justice in a security society. So, outside of justifying punishment, criminology has not engaged much with philosophy and political theory, despite its obvious relevance to addressing issues such as the distribution of security and the role of the state in an increasingly mixed market of security provision, let alone some of the moral and metaphysical 
questions around preemptive intervention. For example, there are some who argue that where there is as strong a reason to believe someone is about to commit an offence as is sufficient to merit post-punishment, then the, that person is pre-deserving of punishment. And that's a sort of a something we don't want to just accept at face value, but we might want to think about that. So even if it appears to are uh, almost certain that a person will commit an offence, respect for the individual as a moral agent needs to acknowledge a categorical window of moral opportunity or a chance to remain innocent, and to close off this window preemptively fails to respect the moral autonomy of the individual to choose to do right. Moving on now, um, an emerging theoretical framework in some social science fields, for example, in critical public health and critical studies of drugs and addiction, is what is being termed new materialist social theory. Now, this approach builds on the tradition of philosophical materialism, uh, which is not the same thing as a materialistic outlook uh, that you may have heard of before, or materialism in the sense of only you know, focusing on earthly possessions and not looking for any deeper spiritual meaning. In philosophical materialism, it's referring to um, matter. And matter, or the material, is that which exists outside of our thoughts and ideas. So there's a long philosophical debate over, do our ideas shape matter, or does matter shape our ideas? Under new materialism, some of its uh, ideas include that Matter can be agentic, that means matter causes action, and that matter and ideas co-produce each other. And that things are not standalone objects, but parts of ongoing processes. So there is a similar orientation here to Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy. Some key concepts in this emerging framework are the, um, is the idea of non-human actors. Um, relational networks of agency, and the assemblage as an analytical unit. So, agency, or the power to act, is not inherent in human subjects, but that's how we usually talk about it. For new materialist thinking, agency is the outcome of a relationship between human and non-human components. Uh, to use a probably a silly example, the ability for me to compose a research paper is only present when I have the knowledge and thoughts, I have the motor skills to write, I have something to write with, such as a notebook or a computer, and a body of existing research to draw upon. My agency, my power to act and write a paper, it only emerges when those things all come together. If I don't have any, if I don't have the knowledge, if I don't have the writing device to compose long complex thoughts, I don't have the ability to actually write that research paper. Agency on this view is dispersed across these relationships, and this is sometimes referred to as an actor network, the collection of relationships that allow action, and this is a network of human and non-human uh, components. And then when you hear the term assemblages, this broadly means the collection of relationships that produce certain phenomena at particular points in time. Now, the relationships in an assemblage are not one-way relationships, but the various components of an assemblage of relationships are also affecting each other. Now this brings us to the key idea of co-production or co-constitution, that things or phenomena are the outcome of relational processes. Another silly example, a hamburger is not actualized as food until it is eaten. It's not food until someone actually eats it. Or a criminal thief does not exist before systems of laws and norms are in place, interacting with the motivated offender and a target. Um, and in other words, a target, such as property to steal, is a constitutive part of what makes a motivated offender a thief. They cannot be a thief without the target. So the target plays an active role in making them a thief, not a passive one. 
Now, in terms of application, one thing to think about is the decentering of human subjectivity. Um, in terms of investigating the co-production of phenomena, examining the material basis of action and ideas, and assemblages of crime. So, this means decentering the subject means rethinking human agency and responsibility. Even a subject's power to act in the world is shaped by the various assemblages of which they form a part. Until now, our much of our common sense and theoretical approaches treat humans as the only source of action, the only source of agency. But let's think about Felsen's crime triangle. If we add our assemblage thinking to this, a motivated offender's power to become criminal only exists where there is that system of motivations and incentives, and where there's a potential target, and where there's a lack of capable guardianship. Without these components, the offender's capacity, their ability to actually become criminal, is actually diminished or limited. So as a result, our, criminologi our criminological analysis might start taking seriously the role played by non-human objects in the production of crime and criminality. So perhaps we might start talking of crime prevention assemblages and examining how the different components of these and not just an individual's psychology or rationality or upbringing or behaviours, shape the capacities and agencies that actually produce crime. So in terms of how this applies or reconstructs crime prevention and criminal justice, well, we might want to think about situational crime prevention and crime prevention through environmental design, because these seem to kind of begin to lean toward this approach because they examine the structural environmental aspects of crime and criminality. And we want to have a look at how situational crime prevention and SEPTED shape certain assemblages of crime and criminality, but also how certain arrangements or forms of crime and criminality shape SCP and SEPTED. So rather than seeing crime prevention and crime or criminality, or the absence of crime and criminality, as two separate components in a one-way causal relationship of prevention, we might want to look at both of these as part of a broader assemblage of relationships. So it's not so much that crime prevention is one thing, and crime and criminality are another thing, but they are interacting with each other in a broader category of phenomena. So this may then impact what we focus on in our prevention approaches and how we conceptualize prevention at a fundamental level. For example, is it about focusing on human behavior or exploring how capacities and agencies are enabled in various arrangements of social and material relationships? So let's just do a quick recap of what we've discussed in this lecture. A fundamental aspect of the shift toward pre-crime and security practices and rationalities is the temporal shift, a focus from after the fact to before the fact, i.e. a preemptive focus. Now tied into this shift in the arrangements of how security is delivered, increasingly across state and non-state, uh, private and commercial actors um, is the balance of this arrangement, all right? So there, additionally, there are also broader concerns around risk. And this isn't just the risk of crime, but risks like job insecurity, environmental catastrophe, health risks. This broader concern about risk is part of the context that shapes this more specific preemptive shift in terms of security and crime prevention. There are also key questions around equitable access to security. We also discussed how other disciplines can inform and be informed by criminology in our thinking about security. International relations, for example, and the concept of human security, and moving beyond nation states and borders in our increasingly globalized context. And additionally, at the end, I mentioned how new materialist approaches 
may be informative as well, shifting our attention from a humanistic idea of the subject or the criminal to examining the broader social and material formations that shape crime, criminality, and crime prevention. Now, up here are a few questions and discussion points. One, are security and freedom necessarily exclusive categories? Can we achieve both, or does one come at the expense of the other? Two, Think about contemporary forms of policing and security. What might be some of the deeper unexamined motivations shaping how these things are currently practiced? Are there economic or political aspects at work that we don't normally think about or pay attention to? How might we think about and practice these things differently? And three, think about crime prevention. What are some of the ways of thinking about different forms of crime and prevention that don't rely only on managing human, that is the offender, incentives or behaviours? What are some of the non-human elements that may be part of a crime situation? You might want to think about the design of a house, the specific weapons available to a criminal, or the ability of offenders to access targets, you know, think widely about that one. On that note, congratulations, you've made it to the end of the session. Thanks for taking the unit, and good luck with your assessments. And thanks for putting up with me as your unit coordinator. And I should also mention I've got some key references uh, related to this week and that I've used this week in the preparation of this lecture, and you might want to have a look through some of these if you're interested.